see public perceptions about the long history of relationship between religion and science? Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me here, Professor Alexander, and for all the work of uh, Juiz de Fora University. I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. I'm very excited to be engaged in this, in this dialogue. Um, as you are well aware, um, the public perception of science and religion is often that the two are inherently or intrinsically in conflict. And, in fact, this is called the conflict metaphor. And this shapes the way our civilization views these matters. So if I go into schools, often uh, students will ask, how can I be a priest and a scientist? I used to be a nuclear physicist and then worked in information systems and then trained to be a priest. And they say, I must be mad or something to be able to do, to do both of these things. Um, so the perception is that uh, there's this in intrinsic conflict. Of course, from a scientist's point of view, scientists like many other people in society have a range of views, you know. So the, so the perception that the public has and the perception of um, within the actual world of working science uh, is very, very different. Scientists, like other people in society, um, have a spectrum of views. So what, what then is the origin of, of this perception of a conflict? And I think as Professor Ron Numbers uh, was probably explaining to you in a recent interview, um, a lot of this comes down to the 19th century. In the 19th century, um, during the Industrial Revolution and afterwards, there was a sense that science was growing in power, particularly its power to transform society. And um, uh, there were certain people who wanted to harness that power to make it um, almost as a, as a way of, of fighting against theology. And so people like Andrew Dixon White wrote a book on the history of the warfare of science and, and theology in Christendom. And he was the Richard Dawkins of the 19th century. And th th these stories then began to pass into popular circulation. And this is the narrative um, that is widely believed today. But I must stress that narratives are not science. Narratives are, are stories that we tell. The truth of um, the history of science and religion and their interaction is much more complicated and much more interesting than any simplistic narrative uh, would suggest. And what do you think would be a more balanced and realistic view? Um, the more balanced and realistic view would be don't trust simple narratives. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Um, Take the story, for example, of, of, of the Big Bang. Now, now, the Big Bang is now the modern theory of cosmology. Um, it is the, the theory of the origin of the universe. And often when I go into a school, someone will ask me, how can I be a Catholic priest and believe in the Big Bang theory? And then I will show them a picture of the man who invented the Big Bang theory with his dog collar, <laughs> his collar of priesthood, because the man who invented the Big Bang theory was a Catholic priest. Most people don't know this. His name was Georges Lemaitre, and he was a Belgian priest and astrophysicist. And he wrote the paper in 1927, which first proposed that the universe had expanded from a hot, fiery initial state. He used Einstein's theories in a new way to predict universal expansion from a hot and compact initial state. Um, but what was interesting was the reception of the Big Bang theory in the in the religious world and in the scientific world. Because the Pope, Pope, Bennett, Pope um, Pius XII, um, gave great honors to Father Georges Lemaitre. He made him the head of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which is the highest privilege that the Pope could give, um, could give anyone in the world of science. But in the Soviet Union, the theory was rejected for 30 years. And there's a famous meeting of astronomers in Leningrad in 1948, where they say we must fight the Big Bang Theory because it's encouraging the priests. So, <laughs> so this, is not, this is not a history that you hear much these days in popular books. Um, but, uh, and that's why you, I think it's very important to be, to be critical of the popular narratives, because the real history is often more complicated uh, and more interesting. Many scientists today affirm that science is Well, I think science and religion are certainly not the same kind of thing. And why should everything in the world be the same kind of thing? If we, if we made everything the same, we wouldn't have history, we wouldn't have art, we wouldn't have literature. Um, religion is a distinct kind of thing. Most of science today, um, we're using, using physics as a paradigm 
Most of science today is about measurement, accurate measurement, and relating things in the world through quantitative laws. Um, religion, by and large, is mostly about persons, persons and their relationship to the divine. So um, most of the time, they're, they're working in different aspects of reality. So there's no particular reason for there to be a conflict. Now, sometimes there are conflicts over accidental matters, what we might call details at the fringes. Um, but, basically, but most of the time, they deal with, with different kinds of things. So there's no inherent reason why there should be, um, w w should be a conflict. But what I do think is that at its best, at its best, um, uh, the same kind of desires operate in religion as operate in certain areas of science, particularly in physics, because you want to know the reasons for things. You want to know the ultimate causes for things, how we came to be the way we are. And that's, and that's something which, that's a kind of question that we look for in physics, but also uh, in, in religion at its best as well. So there is a certain shared desire of becoming fully human, of knowing the answers to ultimate questions, which is shared, in fact, um, by the religious mind and the scientific mind. Okay. In the sense, in what way big particle physicists helped you or hinted you your thinking and beliefs as a scientist? Well, I spent um, six years as a physicist, and I spent three years working at CERN, the laboratory in Geneva, where they've recently discovered the Higgs boson, or think they discovered the Higgs boson. And during that time, I used to go to Mass every Sunday. So um, th there was no sense of conflict in my own mind. Um, what I would say is a special privilege of physicists. Physicists have the opportunity to look at nature at a deep level at a deep level. And at, at the deep level, um, the most common perception is order. But it's order at a level often above the human mind. So a physicist often has to think in a higher number of dimensions than three dimensions, for example. But um, there's, there's a perception of order and beauty. So as a, as a particle physicist, um, I would say that my, my exploration of the world gave me a sense of wonder, a wonder about the world. And that's not proof of God, not directly. It's not direct proof of God. But it can encourage, with an open mind, um, a certain religious sensibility. And that's what it did for me. So. In your review, we say, new groups for existence of the good contributions of contemporary physics and philosophy published in the Harvard Technological Review. What are the news proof coming from physics? Okay. Um, well, as you know, there, there, was, there were many debates over many centuries about proofs for God's existence. And um, in recent years, there's a new battleground. And the new battleground um, is in the area of fine-tuning. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but fine-tuning... Um, arose out of the discovery that the fundamental constants of nature um, seem to be very finely tuned. And what that means is, if you change the ratios, if you, if you imagine that if, if, if there is a God, I assume there is a God, but imagine God in a control room <laughs> with, lots of, with lots of buttons, if you change the buttons very slightly, then, um, then, then there could be no life. We, we could not be here. So, for example, if gravity and the electromagnetic force were changed very slightly in their ratios, then, then we will not be here. So it, it's as if the whole universe is balanced on the edge of a knife, a very, very thin point, and just a little push, and it would all collapse. And, um, uh, and this, is, this is still a problem today. Um, and there are actually three main solutions um, the first solution is that there's a theory we don't know about. Underneath everything else, there's a theory that takes away fine-tuning, so the universe could, could not be other than it is. Um, but we haven't been able to find that theory, and we've spent many decades on it. Maybe it will, it will happen in the future. The second approach is to say that we, we are lucky. We have won the lottery. I'm sure you have lotteries in Brazil, uh, but there's, maybe there's a cosmic lottery that um, in the competition, there, there are a lot of dead universes which absorb all the bad luck. And we are, we, are, we are the ones, we are the lucky ones, and we're here because 
all the other universes were failures. But of course, to believe that, you have to also believe that most of reality is completely invisible to us. It's, um, there's a multiverse beyond our own universe. Okay. Um, and the, th the third main approach is, well, maybe God set it up this way. You know, God actually tuned it this way. So um, these so-called new proofs for the existence of God um, depend a lot on fine-tuning arguments. Um, I, 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 I'm not a great fan of them because um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I am a, a fan of the cosmological argument, the philosophical cosmological argument. Um, Fine-tuning is always, we, we don't know what we're tuning exactly. So um, I reviewed this book, Robert Spitzer's book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, and I thought the physics was very good. Um, the philosophy was, was, was not so good. Because you, to construct a fine-tuning argument, you have to know what you're tuning and we don't really know. We don't have a theory about the metaverse, if you like, the, the bigger picture. So um, uh, I, I think that that's, I, I'm uncertain about the foundations of the theory at the moment. But what, but what we are left with is an extraordinary universe, a universe, we call it the Big Bang, but there's another, there's another word I've heard it described as, the Big Bloom. So <laughs> imagine you've got an explosion and suddenly you get a house. <laughs> you get an explosion, you suddenly get a complicated biological being. You know, it's something so extraordinary in terms of the, uh, uh, the way things are balanced. We, we don't yet have a natural explanation, but I would not automatically um, suppose from this to prove a divine explanation. Does that make sense? It's, it's, um, I think we should be careful with our proofs for God's existence and to, to make sure that they're well-reasoned. I always say I much prefer a good argument that's well-reasoned by an atheist than a bad argument by a Christian, because I think we must be able to argue well and critically, and we must have good philosophical um, uh, foundations to what we say. And you said that you are more inclined to the cosmological argument. Yes. Could you summarize it briefly? The cosmological argument uh, is one of the most famous old arguments for God's existence, and you start with everyday objects. You start, um, imagine the, this table that we're sitting at, or the air that we're breathing, or our own uh, physical beings, and we didn't create ourselves. All of us come from something else, and those things in turn come from something else, and those things in turn come from something else. And the progress goes back and back. It doesn't just go back, but it also funnels. So um, a small number of powerful causes explain a lot of particular, a diversity of particular effects as a kind of funneling down. And the whole process, as we observe the universe, that the funneling suggests there has to be a first cause. It's like the foundation of a house. We don't see the foundation of a house. We see the house. And we, we can infer that there must be things supporting the house underneath. But it has to stop somewhere. It has to, there has to be a, a foundation, otherwise it'd be just empty space and no house. So um, uh, I, I think the cosmological argument is, is still valid, and that, that's my own personal favorite. In your opinion, what are the major obstacles to a dialogue between science and religion? I think the main obstacles to uh, a dialogue between science and religion are ig ignorance, uh, ignorance of history, and ignorance of philosophy. Um, ignorance of history um, can be seen in the fact that there are often simplistic narratives and popular books which don't tell the full story. The history of the relationship of science and religion is complicated. Um, simplistic narratives uh, are, are bad history. So that's, that's one obstacle. Um, oh, but also in philosophy as well. We still have the shadow of what used to be called uh, of positivism. And... Um, about 50 years ago, this was very popular in universities. Positivism really um, more or less suggests that the only valid knowledge is the knowledge that comes from a scientific experiment. The only valid knowledge. Now, of course, that's not true. Um, personal knowledge doesn't come from scientific experiments. Um, literature doesn't come from scientific experiments. History doesn't. You have all these areas of human activity which, are, which are truly generate knowledge, but they're not from... Uh, measuring things under experimental conditions. But we still have the shadow of positivism. Um, and if people uh, become positivist, then it's very hard to think that there's any knowledge apart from what we have from measurements in a laboratory. 
And so there's this general philosophical problem. Now, in, in philosophy, that situation is changing. In academic philosophy, that's changing. There's been a revitalization of the philosophy of religion, partly because of a rejection of positivism and, a, and an acceptance that there are many ways in which we can be said to know things, many kinds of intellectual virtues, which are still intellectually rigorous. But this, this fact has not filtered, out, filtered to all areas of the academy and it's not filtered out to all the society. So you often hear si um, people saying, science says that, as if science is one thing and is a source of all knowledge. But that's, that's not even true in the scientific world. The science is, it depends upon philosophy as well, and there are many kinds of sciences. So I think there's a greater appreciation today of a diversity of knowledge and a diversity of research. But that, um, that revolution is, is incomplete at the moment. Uh, as a Catholic priest, and a philosopher and a physicist, uh, don't you think it's also a fight for the knowledge that gives the power, the, the, the power that gives the knowledge? Also, ah, that's an interesting so, Between these communities. Ah, this is, there's a sociological dimension of the, yes. of, the, of the battle for power. I think that's an aspect of it. Um, and this was predicted by Auguste Comte uh, in the 19th, early 19th century, because he suggested that, uh, in fact, he proposed that the scientists will be the new priests. Yes, that's so, what Mr. Numbers has explained to us. Yes, it yes. Is, it's also that for him it was uh, very difficult to join the, those fields together, yes. uh, science and religion, because it's also a battle for the power. Yes, that no, that, that, no, that's, that's true, that's true. If a, famous, if a famous popular scientist like Stephen Hawking says something about God, then... The New, York, the New York Times will publish it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so um, scientists will often pronounce on metaphysical questions, like a kind of high priesthood, if you like. So I think there is, there is to some extent, I think Comte's vision has come to pass. Comte's vision has uh, become real in our own time. I and I think there is that issue of, of power. But I think both for religious people and for scientists, we need humility. We need humility. And we need to... Um, uh, we need also an appreciation that our particular area of knowledge is not the whole story. It's not the whole story. So 20 years ago, I was a physicist, and um, if I had not trained to be a priest, I would never have studied philosophy. And that would have been an impoverishment of my life, not to study philosophy. But as a, as a physicist, I didn't realize I needed it. I thought I knew everything. You know? <laughs> you know, if you can measure it, then that's all you need. You know? And how do you conciliate those in your personal life? Well, I've, I've been lucky to have um, uh, a, lot of t a lot of patient teachers who've helped to overcome my belief that I knew everything uh, and, and to teach me uh, new ways of thinking all the way through. But if I had to say, if there's one area I would try to encourage, obviously good history, but also good philosophy. I, I wish every student in our schools would study philosophy, every student in college or university would study philosophy. Because um, the temptation in our society, and it's true in Brazil, it's true in, in, in Britain, is that governments and universities will only invest in practical things, in things that, in experiments, in science. But even to be a good scientist, I think you also need to be a good philosopher. Otherwise, you just become a technician, um, making more experiments with the same paradigm. And the really great breakthroughs in science often come with people who have a, a broader education, who have the science, but also think about the world um, creatively and in, and in bigger terms. Uh, but, uh, listen, everything you are telling us today, I think what you are willing to tell us is also that we uh, must learn a new way of thinking. Well, uh, it's, it's, also, that, well it's also an old way of thinking. It's, it's, yeah. a, way, it's a way that all good, um, all good minds in history um, have developed their, their mental faculties by, by studying broadly, by studying history and philosophy and literature, not just becoming na narrow technical specialists. The danger with the narrow technical specialists is that um, they think they understand, but they, um, they, they, they sometimes misunderstand other fields, other disciplines, and even their own disciplines sometimes. Mm. Uh, how do you see the problem of dogmatism in science and religion? Well, the word dogmatism, of course, is a very negative term. Originally, the word dogma meant to teach, and so, uh, or a teaching. So in that sense, it's a good thing. Um, 
But dogmatism, there's a bad sense of dogmatism, which is a closed mind uh, dogmatism. And um, uh, well, this is, this is a universal problem in, in all fields. Um, and uh, even, in, in the, even in the best universities, it's very tempting for the professor, the uh, established professor, to say, I now know everything. And the student makes questions, and the professor just says, be quiet. You know? <laughs> you know. So um, I think we have to encourage um, uh, you know, genuine questioning, op open questions. And this is true also in, in, in religion as well as, uh, as in science. You know. um, uh, one thing that is very difficult to, um, to teach people is critical thinking. I know the word critical thinking sometimes has bad connotations in Brazil, but it's very, very important to be able to think objectively, even about things you believe in passionately yourself. So, um, so I think the attitude we have to cultivate is in the debate, it's not whether I'm right or you're right, but what is the truth? What is the truth? And can we work out the truth? If at the end of a debate, I realize I'm wrong and the other person is right, I will rejoice, I will be happy, <laughs> if we've discovered something true, which is new knowledge. Um, so, uh, but but that's, that's a hard attitude to, um, to encourage, it's a hard attitude to establish uh, in, in, in the education process because it's very easy to think of it as, as a kind of game of football where you know I win you lose or you you know um, or I lose and you win um, what's important to try to encourage is, is genuine dialogue um, concerning the review the miracles of Exodus by calling Hum Humphrey oh gosh <laughs> now that's a very difficult question. Um, can physics explain miracles? Um, I think physics could be used sometimes to evaluate a miracle uh, in the sense of excluding natural causes. Um, so of course uh, uh, there's a very famous shrine in, in um, Europe called uh, Lourdes and um, if, if there is um, a, if there is a belief of a miracle there, they'll ask doctors to see if natural causes can explain the miracle. So I think, so sometimes science in general could be used to um, to exclude natural causes. Um, at least in theory, that's that's one way in which um, science can work. But of course, a miracle is by its nature exceptional. So where science deals with regularities, so most of the time science has very little to say about miracles um, because it deals with the majority of things that happen for the most part. The philosopher Aristotle said, what is natural is what happens for the most part, or what happens mostly. He didn't exclude exceptions. Um, by and large, physics studies what is natural, not what is supernatural. So, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily exclude those things either. But it's a, it's a philosophical issue, not principally a scientific issue. How do you see the current debates between creationists and evolutionists? <laughs> because one benefit of being in Brazil is that this is the, the, the conflict between creationists and evolutionists is not a conflict, really. Um, and there may be many interesting reasons for this. Uh, it, it's really an issue in the United States in a big way, um, and also to some extent in the Muslim world. And I think the, fun, the, the issue fundamentally is what is the nature of God's interaction with the world? What is the nature of God's interaction with the world? So um, there is a habit among extreme Protestants and also in much of the Muslim world to think that God is the only cause, not just the first cause, but the only cause of everything that exists. So God is like a watchmaker, like, um, uh, like a manufacturer of every detail. Um, the traditional habit, um, certainly in Western Catholic Christianity, since the Middle Ages at least, has been God cultivates creation, not manufactures creation. So, so God is working in, in, with creation, um, more like um, God acting like a gardener, a gardener, rather than a manufacturer. And so I think it's interesting if you look at the Catholic-Protestant divide on evolution, Evolution has been less of a problem in the Catholic world than in the Protestant world, but it comes back to metaphysics. It comes back to how the, um, one believes God interacts with the world. 
if you believe God is the only cause, then evolution is a problem because um, it means, for several reasons, it means you've got a problem of suffering. It means also um, that there seems to be a conflict between uh, um, what your religion tells you and what the science tells you. But if you think God interacts by creating a world, creatures that create other creatures, and God works through secondary causes, um, then uh, an evolutionary model seems quite natural. It's quite a natural way of thinking. Now, there are still some problems, but it's less, it's less of, a, of a sense of conflict. So I think um, the issue fundamentally comes back to the metaphysics, comes back to the, the, the philosophy of how God interacts with the world. But there's one other issue um, with um, evolution and creation, which is that um, when describing evolution, often very powerful metaphors are used, very powerful metaphors. So, for example, in my country, um, uh, we have the, uh, the, the atheist Richard Dawkins, and he is famous for using phrases like the selfish gene. And there are other books called, the, there's another book called the selfless gene, and there's another book called the selfish genius, which is about Richard Dawkins. Um, but the, um, the interesting thing is genes are not selfish or selfless. They're just things. <laughs> But, but, meta but powerful metaphors have been added to the description of nature. And, that ha and they often have ethical implications. So I think sometimes religious people get worried, and not without some reason, because a, a powerful narrative is being proposed for society with ethical effects as well. Because if you believe that it's all about being selfish to be successful, then of course society based on those principles will be very different from a society where sacrificial love, for example, is regarded as a high principle. So people get, I think, um, the issues are over philosophy and, 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 and also over ethics, particularly with the use of powerful metaphors. I think we must be very careful with the, uh, um, with the metaphors we use and not use the authority of science to their justify um, these over-powerful metaphors. Uh. You work in a very prominent university, University of Oxford. So uh, I would like to know more about uh, this science and religion dialogue in, in these traditional universities. And also, how do you see the field in Latin America and perhaps even in Juiz de Fora, the work that has been done here? Okay. Um, in some sense, science of religion is not new. So Aristotle, um, 23 centuries ago, um, looked at, invented biology, um, invented a lot of our logic, and talked about God. So he was actually doing science, and uh, he was also talking about the philosophy of God. Um, with, within, within Oxford, uh, science and religion is um, more like a kind of umbrella, um, uh, because to some extent, science and religion are not well-defined terms. They are terms that are somewhat vague. Um, but but w within this context of science and religion, we, we can discuss, there, there are particular fields that are very interesting, mainly philosophy um, and mainly history. And I think that the field is growing in Oxford um, because, it's, because it's intrinsically interesting, but also because it is interesting also for the public. So um, most que many questions that academics are asked by the public are about science and religion. So it's important that in academia we, we have... Um, uh, we know something about these fields and uh, are able to, to help people to, to do good work or to understand clearly. So I think Oxford, in Oxford, um, the field is growing. Uh, here in Brazil, just, it's an interesting... Um, I've been doing a study for a couple of years uh, into science and religion in Latin America, generally. Of course, Brazil's situation is a little bit different um, from much of Latin America. Um, I think there are many opportunities here which are different to the United States. You mentioned the issue of evolution. Evolution has been less of a problem in Latin America, or, or less perceived as a problem than in traditionally Protestant North America, for example. So there is that issue. And also you have a, a mix of Anglo-Saxon and continental philosophy here. There are the influences of French Illuminism. And, um, and this also means that um, uh, someone... In, Many people who are well educated in Brazil will have a mixture of philosophical influences, which are perhaps a little bit less common in parts of the United States or, or in Europe, because of these this blending of different different worlds. 
So uh, I think it's in intrinsically interesting. And of course, generally, um, Brazil is itself very interesting today. I, I, 16 years ago, I was working here as a business executive, um, as a consultant with um, part of Banco Ito. And Brazil is completely transformed in the last 16 years uh, in terms of um, uh, what's happening in the universities, in the economy, uh, and so on. So there, there's just going to be a lot of opportunities for the future. The challenge, of course, is building bridges. So uh, and one reason for me being now uh, visiting um, Brazil over the last week or so is I want to help to build those bridges. So we have good contacts between scholars uh, in European universities, United States, and, and in Brazil, because we still have this little bit of isolation of uh, the Anglo-Saxon world from the uh, Latin American world uh, and Europe from Latin America, and between the disciplines. So whatever we can do to help to break down some of those barriers, um, that would be a good thing. And I particularly praise the work being done in Juiz de Fora because um, it's interesting how many collaborations are developing between this university and universities in, in North America and in Europe. So 16 years ago, when I was at CERN, we only had a very few Brazilians working at CERN. But now it's very interesting for me to learn that you have a physics group here at Juiz de Fora who also have physicists working at CERN in Geneva. So obviously the extent of international collaboration is growing. And I think uh, this university, Juiz de Fora, is, is a pioneer in that. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Right, okay. Please comment, please. Oh dear. <laughs> I believe in a dialogue of science and religion. I don't believe in a mixing. I think it's a, it's a lot of easy, or dangerous mixing of, of fields. And um, uh, there's a lot of bad stuff written in science and religion. So um, uh, I don't like it. Uh, I can't help it. There's a, I mean, these books will continue to be written and they will continue to be popular for the same reason that science and religion is popular generally. People want to know the answers to the big questions. Um, uh, but I think the, the, main way of, um, uh, the main way of countering this is giving better training in philosophy and in history. Um, respectful dialogue is good, but a mixing is often bad. Uh, I would, uh, you know, it often causes a lot of confusion. In your opinion, what are the most important steps or attitudes for opening and broadening the dialogue between science and religion? What are the most important steps? Um, well, as I commented uh, previously, I think better philosophy, generally speaking, um, and uh, also philosophy of recent years. Um, philosophy of 50 years ago was, was much more positivist and hostile to anything outside a strictly... Um, uh, any kind of knowledge that was not strictly scientific. And this, this still overshadows the academy today to some extent. Um, so uh, courage, courage better, better philosophy, but also um, better, more meetings between humanities and science generally. Um, I don't know what the situation is like in Brazil exactly, but certainly in, in England um, there's a big division between science and the humanities. They, they don't really talk at a deep level. Uh, about things very often. So I'd like to encourage more events where science and humanities um, issues are, are debated. And one way of doing this is to almost to have a, have a humanities professor explain a science and then have a science, a science professor explain one aspect of the humanities and see how they perceive one another's fields because that's often a good way of starting a, a more in-depth dialogue and overcoming misconceptions. So... Um, uh, I don't think there's any one easy answer, um, but, but good events that encourage dialogue are excellent. There are also some, some very good books that have been written recently. Um, uh, there was a book written by a man called Ian McGilchrist. Ian McGilchrist started out as a philosopher who became very interested in the division of the brain into two hemispheres. And um, he actually realized this was an unfashionable topic. He became a medical scientist for many years and became a consultant. They went back into philosophy. Then he wrote this book, so it's a 20 year process. Um, and the book was called The Master and Its Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. And what's interesting is that it's, it draws from science, 
but it's got a lot of interesting insights for the humanities because his thesis is that the, the left hemisphere is taking over our civilization. The computational aspects, the um, what we might call the logical reasoning aspects, the syllogistic reasoning. Um, but what we lack is context. What we lack is the big picture stuff. And without that, um, all our facts will eventually become disordered um, and uh, it'll be kind of intellectual chaos. So we, we need these other, so in some ways the brain science helps us to understand why we need the humanities. We need other things besides just measurement and facts. We also need context. So sometimes science can help to, to teach us these things. Do you believe there is such a thing as a scientific worldview? Um, there is a scientific worldview in the popular sense, uh, and as you probably know, it's called scientism and it's more or less positivism, which is that the only valid knowledge is scientific knowledge. Um, this, is not a, this is not a view that's held universally by scientists, I, I, I must stress. Um, the interpretation of science and the practice of science are two different things. Um, but there is this view. I suppose as someone who used to be a physicist, I can testify that it's, it can sometimes be a problem if you spend all your life doing physics. So um, uh, I spent years and years measuring things, writing computer software, um, uh, working out equations, making calculations. And of course, if you do this all day long, it's very easy to think the whole world is one giant computer, okay? <laughs> because we can't help it. You know, the, 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 the habits of, of daily life, the habits of intellectual practice affect the way that we see the world. So... Um, there is a sort of scientific worldview that comes about through habitually doing nothing but science all day long. And, and I think, therefore, a good scientist should try to do some other things besides science in the strict sense of philosophy, humanities, and so on. Um, otherwise, I think in the end, he or she will not be such a good scientist. Hmm. Do science if we discover the actual Earth is not the center of the universe? Do you believe that science We've got to ask, what does success look like for a scientist? If you open a physics book, uh, what you see are equations and numbers. So if you believe that the whole of reality is equations and numbers, maybe science will eventually tell us everything about nature. But personally, I don't believe si um, uh, everything about nature is things you can measure. Um, in fact, most of the things that are important for human beings are not things you can measure, like friendship, or love, or joy, or the passions, or music, or art, or architecture, aesthetics, beauty. Um, I mean, if everything was a simultaneous equation, it would be, it'd be a very boring life, okay? Um, so um, what science, science is very good at doing science, um, but it, there are lots of things it doesn't do very well, and that's why we need, other, we need other fields as well. If science could explain everything, I think we'd be a rather sad world, because, because if, if could science, science as we understand it in terms of quantitative measurements um, and making up scientific laws and discovering scientific laws and so on, uh, I, think, I think life is richer than this. But Shakespeare knew this, many centuries ago, because at the beginning of Hamlet, the play Hamlet, there's a famous line, there were more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than dreamt of in your philosophy. And I think that the world is bigger than our theories. Uh, and, I and that's good, that's a wonderful thing. In interestingly, there's, um, uh, for, m for many years we've tried to create an artificial machine which is based on the idea that everything about life that's important can be represented by a number, artificial intelligence. It's interesting, this program has largely failed um, because it's proven very, very difficult to um, code even everyday things about human life and intelligence. It's very, very difficult to turn these things into numbers. So I think there's, there's some empirical evidence that you know, when you try to think about the world just in those terms, uh, you risk not only um, uh, failing to understand the world properly, but also wasting a lot of time and money in the in wrong kinds of research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if 
final words? <laughs> Any final words? Two minutes. <laughs> two words. Okay. Um, well, just to conclude, I, I, I'd like to just thank you for your hospitality at Juiz de Fora. It's very exciting coming back to Brazil after 16 years to see all the changes in Brazil. I think it's a very exciting time. They used to say Brazil was the country of the future. I think the future is beginning to happen now uh, in, the, in this country. But I just encourage you, uh, uh, all your students really, to have confidence because um, you have a lot to offer the world and the world needs you. So I do, enc I do encourage um, students to keep training, to, to try to build up links with other countries. Um, collaborations. A lot of people in Europe and the United States are now very interested in what's happening in Latin America, but they don't know who to talk to. They don't know where to start. And um, if you can start to, to build collaborations, I think this will be mutually good. And um, I, th I have a lot of hope for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>